morning. It's so good to be here with so many friends. Thank you, Susie, as always, for a wonderful conference. So what I, what I want to do this morning is very briefly go into the science of epigenesis and how we influence our genes rather than our genes influencing us. Because the science dictates that we do, in fact, govern gene expression, who we are. And the reason for doing this is I am always amazed how we're overwhelmed by this di high diet, uh, high-fat diet, low-fat diet, ketogenic, paleo diet, and yet we have a raging obesity epidemic worldwide. That makes no sense to me. Um, we hear about stress, and yet there are over 600 forms of stress management techniques, and yet stress in the workplace, in our personal lives, in clinics all over the planet, is, is the u most ubiquitous problem that we have. And we have an environment in which we are concerned about environmental toxins, uh, hormone disruptors, uh, all forms of exposure, if you will, to potentially lethal carcinogenic materials in our environment. But what we don't ask is who is the receiver? Who are we to be in interaction with all of these variables? And so to me, the, the uh, task is to create an individualized biochemical profile so that we know who we are, how these influences are impacting us. And that's, that's what I want to do in these next uh, few minutes. OK, that's who I am. Um, so what we're looking at is the epigenetics era. And the first uh, uh, definition is genomics, which is that of the gene. Now, the gene does not change. Okay? The gene is invariant, except if it's damaged by radiation exposure or some toxic uh, chemical. Next is epigenetics. Epigenetics is everything that impacts the gene after the sperm and ovum meet. That's it. That's the transfer of genetic information. After that, it all is dependent on the environment in which the gene operates as to whether it's going to be expressed or suppressed, whether it's going to be manifested or not. And last is the microbiome, and we'll get to that. That's really the intestinal tract. And so this is the task uh, of genetics. This is what it's all about. You don't have to know anything more about genetics than this. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, I've, I've got most of my, you'll, you'll not remember anything about this lecture except the cartoon, so there's a bunch coming up. Um, so this is, we're looking at developing, and I'm, I'm talking about a research project, and I'll show you the details of this. It's not going to be completed until sometime in 2018, but it's to develop a tripartite assay. And to the left, you see the, the gene, and that's like a blueprint. The blueprint is simply a design. It tells you nothing about the finished product. The bloodstream is then the building. It's the manifestation of the genes in the biochemistry of the body. And the last is then the intestinal tract. From the mouth to the anus is the experience of being in the body. And that's like living in a house. And this is what we're after, this tripartite assay of three parts that will tell us exactly who we are. Then you don't have to wonder, should I have a high fat or low fat? That, you will know precisely metabolically what your body is capable of. Like, for instance, you'll know whether you should eat walnuts or almonds. It'll be that, it's that degree of specific. Um, so it's, and you'll also know things that are <laughs> invariant. So bad news, it's curiosity. So there are some things we can't do anything about. Uh, <laughs> you're right. Uh, what we, what th this is a critical point here because although the gene itself is invariant, it does not change, it is surrounded by a molecular substance, a single nucleotide polypeptide. It's a, it's a chemical sheath around the gene that, decide, that determines whether the gene will be turned on, turned off. It's like a rheostat on a light switch. How bright or how dim do you want it to be? And the third point, SNPs are influenced by diet, by nutrition, by stress, by radiation, physical and the physical and psychosocial environment, by the medications we use, both over-the-counter and prescription, and a sense of purpose. There's some great research on how a sense of purpose actually can alter the expression of uh, the genome. So this is... <laughs> Like I said, you don't look anything like the long-haired skinny kid I married 25 years ago. I need a DNA sample to make sure it's still you. So. <laughs> Again, there are useful functions for, for the, the DNA, although they, they do change over time. Um, okay, next here. 
Okay, so this is the, the research project that I've been talking about, and it's co-sponsored by three entities. Thorn, which is a nutraceutical company in New York. It's the only company that actually was given the permission to use the Olympic logo uh, because of submitting its research base in nutraceuticals. Uh, Wellness FX, which is a San Francisco startup owned by Thorn that looks at blood and the profile, and I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. So it's the, the genetics, the blood profile, and then we're working with the Mayo Clinic in the laboratory, and you'll see why why the use of a, of a correct and good high-quality laboratory is so critical to all of this work. We looked at 50 individuals, uh, Olympic athletes, uh, CEOs, uh, uh, very uh, Navy SEALs. These were extremely healthy individuals and, and developed at this profile. And actually, there were 10 people here at the summit that participated in this early study, and this will presumably be available mm, sometime mid 2018 for all of us. So what did we test? We looked at the genetics, the blood, and the microbiome for these individuals. And the genetic biomarkers are critical because we selected ones that are stable from time one to time two. Now, one of the things we did is we, we submitted a blood sample uh, in time one and then took the same frozen blood sample three months later, submitted it to the same lab, you get totally different results. So lab, labs are not terribly good at doing this yet. They will get better, but, but it's not. So we, we've working with the Mayo Clinic to make sure that the, the lab is high quality. Secondly, that changes can be made by actionable, modifiable steps that we can take. I'm not interested in looking at genes that are simply biomarkers of disease. That's not the model. This is a biomarker of health. It tells us, is your biochemistry moving in a positive direction or negative? The changes can be detected in a minimum time frame of 10, I'm sorry, maximum time frame of 10 to 12 weeks although some of these changes in our genes happen in a matter of seconds and minutes, and they're commercially available. So those are our criteria for selecting, and those genes govern these seven pillars. I'm not gonna go into these, but there are seven pathways from methylation, inflammation, oxidative stress, detoxification. These are the seven pathways in the body that are governed by about 30 or 40 critical genes that determine health and illness. Um, so it's this, it's uh, eat less, exercise more, invest in a time machine so you can go back and choose parents with better genetics. So this is really the, the, the trick. Um, so this is uh, a dashboard of what the results of the profile will look like. If you look at the left side, you'll see the microbiome is part of it, the genetic model is part of it, and also then the bloodstream. And we'll take a look at uh, a detail here um, this is a tip, this, by the way, this is a real patient, but not, uh, but not I mean, this is real data, but not the real patient. Uh, and what you'll see is you'll see a sequence of, of dots, if you will, that are red, yellow, green. Green is good, yellow is borderline, red is a problem. And it progresses over time so a person can map. Where are your lipids today? Where are they after you make the changes that are prescribed? And where do you need to go? So it's very clear. It's, we did a study looking at how motivational this is once you have this information. Um, so this is, <laughs> this is how you track your own evolution. I demand a DNA test. And teddy bear's a problem there. Um, now, the microbiome, to me, is, is the, the missing piece, and it's the last piece that we're working on. So the genetic and blood composition is ready now, and it's, it's been undertaken, and, it, and it's ready for prime time. The biome is much more difficult because you have 300 biomarkers in, in the biome, and also the biome consists of one trillion cells, more than a trillion cells. There are more cells between your mouth and your anus and in your whole body. It's astounding. It governs most of what we determine as, as, immuni as uh, immunity and is also the blood-gut brain reaction. So you have a, in the place where you find the most receptor sites comparable to the intestinal tract is in the human brain. Um, so it says, don't take these if you're a nursing, pregnant, or about to become pregnant. 
<laughs> so the goal of this elaborate assay is to give useful information. Whenever we look, whenever we have guidelines, the American Heart Association guidelines, or any of the other dietary and nutrition or stress guidelines or environmental exposure guidelines, they're all general. You know, what does that really have to do with us? And this, this assay is, in fact, what it will do with us. Um, now, I'm going to look ahead. There are two technologies. This is looking about six months to as much as a year in advance. Two technologies that are going to make this even more practical and more engaging. One is a nanotechnology. So this is an ingestible technology. It's, it's smaller than the head of a pin. And in the transit time in the intestinal tract between 24 and 72 hours, it will transmit data to a patch on your arm to your, to your smartphone and it will tell you all of the vital signs. So if you think, as an example, that you are appropriately taking a metformin for uh, diabetes, if you look in the upper part, you'll see that's good dosing. It's been taken on, on a regular basis, it had the desirable effect on blood chemistry, and you look in the lower right, or on the bottom, and you find that this is erratic. This is someone who's not taking their medications properly, their blood chemistry, blood sugar levels are not responding appropriately, so it's unequivocal. Uh, you, you know, at, when you prescribe metformin to a patient with diabetes, you're never sure. It can take months, it can take years to figure out, is this a right dosing? Is it having a desired effect? You really don't know. This tells you in a matter of minutes what, what is and is not happening. So you can think about this applied to any dietary practice. So if you think that you're a poor metabolizer of blood fat, then you look and you see, my blood chemistry is staying quite normal, even though I've ingested a high-fat meal. Uh, and not everyone needs to eat low fat, period. That's just a myth. Every dietary recommendation I can think of is a myth. Every stress management technique is a myth. Every exposure to an environmental toxin is a myth unless it's got something to do with you, with us. Um, so the next is then, how many of you like blood draws? Right, raise your hands. Oh, right, nobody. Uh, everyone hates blood draws. I hate getting blood drawn. I hate watching those vials fill. Um, this is a new technology, which is a patch. You put it on your arm. In 45 seconds, it draws 200 milliliters of blood totally painlessly. It leaves a little reddening area, and that 200 milliliter is then translated into 50 to 100 Blood bio, blood-borne biomarkers. So suddenly, the issue of I don't like testing, that therefore I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to trace how this impacts me. Goes out the window. We don't have to be concerned about that anymore. So it's something that it, it's virtually uh, painless. It's going to be inexpensive. It's probably you know twenty dollars or thirty dollars, something like that, to have a blood assay done this way no more blood draws, and we'll be able to monitor our blood chemistry on an ongoing basis. So this is a, a great new technology. This is in the final stages of FDA approval, should be available along with the nanotechnology sometime in 2018. So it makes this profile of genes, blood, and microbiome very, very accessible, inexpensive, and gives us the information we need to know what our health practices need to be. So it's this, it says, oh master, is it proper for a monk, monk to use email? He said, oh yes, as long as there's no attachment. <laughs> and <laughs> I just, uh, anyway, I, I love that. <laughs> just, um, my, my, uh, Susie knows this, she's still here. My ambition in life is to do a whole lecture in just cartoons. Um, so th this really is that what we're looking at is this interface between sophisticated biotechnology, uh, genetic sampling, uh, blood assays of 50 to 100 biomarkers instead of the 20 to 25 you get when you, gum, when, when you look either hyper or hypo range for a patient in a clinic and largely you ignore the patterns, ignore the results. So this interface between the high, very sophisticated uh, computerized sampling and, and sampling techniques, i.e. nanotechnology and the bloodless sampling device is, and the intuition. So one of the things we do is once this information is collected, you have your report, you have then anywhere between 15 and 30 minute consult with a nutritionist or a physician or an exercise physiologist but some, or a genetic counselor that can help you then fine tune exactly 
what it is that you need and also give you a time interval. They'll say, let's, let's do this, try it out, let's test, retest in six months. So this is not something you're going to do every day or every week. It may be six months or even once a year, but it will tell you objectively, unequivocally, the kind of diet you need, the kind of stress management, the kind of environmental exposure. So this is the last uh, point. So what do we know? We know that this tripartite assay is a definitive kind of sampling um, that will be available and is, in, in is within the year. Um, that genes predict probabilities, not certainties. What I object to when I see the companies cropping up that give predictions about disease is they're all statistical. 80% of this, 50% of that, 40%. How do you know? Are you going to end up in the 20% that has the identical genetic composition and does not manifest the disease? Or are you going to be the individual who gets a false negative and you think you're fine, and in fact, you end up with that condition? So again, these, these probability prediction disease models are not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the ability to check biochemical changes that move you in a positive or negative direction. Uh, these are biomarkers of health, not disease prediction. Um, the application of single genes or monogenic prediction is simply wrong. Um, monogenic diseases occur within the first six months of life. After that, it's all multiple interactive epigenetic uh, uh, predispositions. Um, the, uh, oh, the, interesting. The human base is around 23, 21 to 23,000 genes. Actually, the DNA coding portion of the human gene is only about 5%. So 95% of the genetic code right now, we don't know what it does. It's called the dark genome. No one knows its function. It's like dark matter in the universe. We don't really know what it does. It's there. We think. Can't even detect it. Um, genes are turned on or off like a rheostat. So it's not an either or. It's that something is expressed or not. If you have a predisposition to Alzheimer's, is that expressed because of diet or is it suppressed? Um, Genes, genes change. What we do matters. The, the expression of the gene is critical. Every day, every minute, everything we're doing is changing our expression of that gene. Um, the majority of genes are governed by beliefs and lifestyle choices. And lastly, there's even a whole subset of genetic analysis now looking at Neanderthal genes. It turns out that the Neanderthal and human, human species interbred. And there are, in fact, remnants of Neanderthal genes. It makes you wonder about stress response, hyperaggression, things that we don't understand and would like to change about ourselves may, in fact, be a genetic expression of a Neanderthal gene that's alive and well within us. OK, I think I'm on time, and that's all for now, folks. <laughs> OK. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you.